He's at the Carnegie Institute for uh, Science, Earth, and Planetary Lab, um, and had previously been at um, Caltech at University of Virginia. Uh, comes from uh, Michigan. Already has one PhD. Working on a second one. What else did I leave out? And <laughs> anyway, she's going and she's going to start working at the Naval Academy and uh, down the line. So there's all sorts of interesting things here. So, ma'am, if uh, let me turn it over the program to you and get you hooked up, and we'll get going. Thanks, everyone, for uh, inviting me to come and speak to your group today. Um, I will be talking about the topic of investigating the chemical ingredients that make planets. Um, and a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Carnegie Earth and Planets Laboratory in Washington, D.C. Um, and as was just stated, um, my background comes from starting uh, at the University of Michigan, doing my PhD at Caltech in California, and then coming over to this coast for my first postdoc at the University of Virginia. And now I've been um, at the Carnegie Institution for Science for about a year and a half. And starting this fall, and actually I'm going to be a um, assistant professor in the physics department at the Naval Academy. So I'll be staying in the area. Um, and so my work, uh, really focused on some of these big questions that we have in astronomy. And so these are questions like, how did life originate on Earth? And does life exist anywhere else? And this could be past life or life that is existing currently or life that could form in the future. And these are really big questions that require interdisciplinary teams to answer. You need people who understand astronomy, biology, chemistry, and geology to all come together to answer these questions. But um, from my perspective, thinking about this as an astrochemist, we can break down these questions into ones that we can investigate through uh, chemical uh, tracers throughout the planet formation process. So for the question of how did life originate on Earth, we can think about where did the chemical ingredients for life come from? And when I talk about chemical ingredients for life, we're going to start with really basically the elements that we know are necessary for life here on Earth, including carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So where did chemical elements come from? And then, um, or does life exist anywhere else? We want to think about what is the likelihood of forming Earth-like planets that also contain these important uh, ingredients for life. And so we're thinking about how uh, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen can be incorporated into an Earth-like planet, there's multiple different stages of the planet formation process in which you can incorporate these elements. So this includes the first step of accretion of materials from the surrounding area when the planet is forming. Uh, later, these materials are going to be processed and then differentiated between the interior of the planet and the surface where uh, life exists um, on Earth. And then also later stage delivery from things like impacts of asteroids or comets, which can deliver additional materials onto the surface of the planet. And so all of these phases are opportunities to either gain or lose uh, elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So we really un want to understand how this process occurs for our own Earth, but also for Earth-like planets forming around other stars across the galaxy and see uh, if these processes are likely to result in similar amounts of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen on other planets. And so when we think about uh, our solar system today, we know that it looks something like this. Of course, this picture is not scale, but to show that we have uh, the sun with uh, four interior rocky planets, including the Earth. Uh, just want to define uh, quickly that one AU astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. That'll be something I will um, reference throughout the talk quite a bit. Um, and so we have these four interior rocky planets and then four uh, exterior gas giants in our solar system. And this is what it looks like today. But we, if we go back in time over 4.6 billion years, it would have looked something more like this, where we have in the center a young forming star surrounded by this disk of mostly gas with tiny dust grains that uh, came from the surrounding interstellar medium. And so it is out of this disk, the proto 
planetary disk or planet forming disk, which we think that in the center uh, ring of that disk, we're going to have planets forming. And so what we want to understand in my work is how different chemical elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen are distributed throughout this gas and how they can eventually end up in forming planets. And so we have to start all the way back in the beginning, thinking about where this uh, planetary material first originated. So in the interstellar medium, the uh, space between the stars, we have these tiny dust grains less than a micron in size and a lot of gas. And then this material will, uh, once it becomes too dense, it will collapse into a core forming a star. And then through this uh, process of star formation, uh, the conservation of angular momentum will result in the formation of a disk around that star. And so it's this rotating disk of gas and dust around the star that we think the planets will form out of. Now, from a chemical perspective, we're interested in what happens to materials depending on what chemical phase they are in. So different things will happen to the gaseous materials versus the solid materials in this uh, planet forming disk. So over time, the gas will be cleared out of the system, either accreted onto the central star, lost to space, or accreted into gas giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn in our own solar system. Meanwhile, the solid materials uh, will stick around and form Earth-like planets, the solid cores of giant planets like Jupiter, and uh, planetary debris like asteroids and comets. And so, uh, from a chemical perspective, we're very interested in whether these elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen are existing in the gas or the solid phase, because that'll determine whether they end up in Earth-like planets if they're in the solid phase or if they're largely lost uh, in the gas. And ultimately, uh, this will result in the formation of a planetary system somewhat like our own solar system. And so, of course, our own solar system uh, is a fully formed mature system, and we can't really look back at what it had been like in its early planet forming stages, but we can get an idea of what it might have been like by looking at stars that are currently young and going through this early planet forming phase. So that's what my research focuses on, is studying these planet forming or protoplanetary disks. Uh, this is a series of images uh, from the ALMA telescope, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile. And so what you're looking at here is a mission that's coming from millimeter-sized dust grains in these disks. And what you notice by looking at these, uh, I think, 16 different disks here, is it, oh no, it's 20, 20 different disks here, is that they all look very different. And so you can see a lot of different structures. Some have these big rings with gaps in them. You can see in this one, there's a bit of a spiral um, structure going on. Some of them are larger, some of them are smaller. So this is showing just the range of different planet forming environments that we have around different young stars across the galaxy. And what we wanna understand is how this range of different planet forming environments translates into forming different planetary systems and different bodies within those systems. So here is a depiction of exoplanetary systems, which isn't showing up quite as well on the screen, but uh, illustrating how in our own solar system, we have um, the inner disk has the four rocky planets and the outer disk has large gas giants, but we know that around other stars, exoplanet observations have revealed that sometimes you have large gas giants that are close to your star, Sometimes you have um, a series of small planets. They also find a lot of planets that are in between the size of um, Earth and Neptune in our solar system that we just don't have any examples of in the solar system. So we know that there's a vast variety of different architectures of planetary systems around different stars in our galaxy. And we wanna understand how we get from different stages um, uh, stages of planet formation that result in these vast variety of different planetary systems, some being like our solar system and some being very, very different. At the same time, looking within our solar system, we know that there are a variety of different bodies. So these are meteorites that come from different parent body asteroids. We have um, planets even like Earth and Mars are very different climates and different sizes and have different properties 
and then we have comets. And so we want to understand how um, we can form all of these different wide variety of planetary bodies through this uh, same planet formation process. And so one way that uh, we can connect protoplanetary disks to their potential planetary outcomes is by looking at some of the properties of protoplanetary disks that directly relate to the planetary systems that can form from them. So for example, we have the total mass of protoplanetary disks, which can tell you about the number of planets that you can form and their potential sizes. The composition of the disk will tell you about the compositions of the planets you can form where the gas goes into gas giant atmospheres like those of um, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus in our solar system. And the solids go into cores of those gas giants or rocky planets like the Earth and Mars or planetary debris like asteroids and comets. And so uh, the third property that we're interested in is the lifetime of protoplanetary disks because how long the gas in the system lasts can tell you about how much time you have to form different types of planets and um, things about the mechanisms that can control this planet formation. And where the astrochemistry comes in is that we can probe all of these different properties, mass, composition, and lifetime of protoplanetary disks using emission from different molecular species in the disk gas. But in order to interpret this molecular emission, we have to have a very good understanding of the physical and chemical structure of protoplanetary disks. And so a little bit um, of an overview of what the physical and chemical structure is like. Uh, so here I have a diagram showing a vertical slice edge on through a planet forming disk with a star in the center. And we have uh, to orient you with some of the language for different parts of the disk. We have the midplane uh, stretching right out along the middle here, which is where we think that planets form because it has the most material. And then drifting away in either direction, we have the surface layers, which are more highly irradiated from the central star. And then we have the inner disk um, and the outer disk. And so the vast majority of the disk is made up of gas. It has a cosmic composition being largely um, hydrogen and a little bit of helium. Uh, we also have a solid component, which is about 1% of the total mass. This is largely silicate and carbonaceous material inherited from the interstellar medium. And uh, the uh, volatile elements that we care about, like our oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen, are actually a very, very small uh, percentage of the total amount of material. So it's only about one in every 10,000 atoms relative to hydrogen is going to be um, one of these important elements uh, that we care about in terms of life on Earth. And so when we think about um, the chemistry of the disk, it's really important that we understand both pressure and temperature because that's going to tell you about which type of chemical reactions can happen. And so it's important to take into account that throughout the disk, we have a variety of different environments in terms of density, or you can think of this as a pressure and temperature. And the uh, density is largely based on the formation mechanism of the disk. And this results in a lot of dense material close to the star and in the midplane with density falling off in either direction as you go outwards. And the temperature is largely coming from irradiation from the central star. So you have the surface of the disk that is highly irradiated and very warm and close to the star being irradiated warm. But then the material in the midplane actually protects it and you get down to very, very cold temperatures, even down to almost tens of Kelvin, uh, at which chemistry uh, happens very, very slowly. And even in terms of densities, we're also at uh, very extreme low pressures. As you can see, the numbers here are sort of 10 to the 12 to 10 to the four. And for comparison, the uh, density of the air in this room is 10 to the 19 per cubic centimeter. So these are very, very extreme conditions for chemistry to occur under. And it actually takes a lot of effort, both on theory and in terms of laboratory work to understand what types of chemical processes we think are going to occur under these conditions. Uh, in addition to contribute to the uh, chemistry, we have stellar radiation coming from the central star and then interstellar radiation and cosmic rays that pass through the disk. 
And all of these different environments in terms of temperature, pressure, and radiation result in a range of different chemical compositions of the gas that you can get throughout the disk. And so here is showing a um, rough diagram where you expect to get uh, some species freezing out closer to the uh, star and some which are more volatile, which will freeze out further away. So you have sort of these bands in radius and also in um, the vertical height of different uh, chemical compositions that if you have a planet forming in this region versus this region, it's going to end up with a very different composition, both in its solid and gaseous phases. And that can be interesting for its potential for life and its, for its evolution. So in terms of methods, how do we study these protoplanetary disks? Um, in my work, I focus on using computational modeling in addition to uh, observations from different telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope and the ALMA array in Chile. And so we really need this combined approach because as I showed in the last few slides, the um, physical and chemical structure of protoplanetary disks is very complicated and changes a lot throughout their structure. So this is where we rely on the chemical modeling so that we can start with an assumed structure and uh, parameters for the star and the disk and its environment, and then do modeling of radiative transfer and then chemistry in order to make a prediction of what we think the uh, chemical structure of the disk gas is going to be, and then ultimately make predictions about the molecular emission that we expect to see from our telescopes. So in uh, combination with this, we use uh, direct observations of these protoplanetary disks in order to be able to test the models and really get at what we think the underlying chemical composition is. And so um, we have uh, observations across the electromagnetic spectrum that are uh, important for probing different sections of the chemical composition of the disk. Uh, in particular, in terms of molecular species, there are a variety that have important spectral lines in the infrared and also at the longer radio wavelengths, which we can observe with um, largely space telescopes in the infrared and ground-based arrays in the um, radio wavelengths. And these uh, observations provide us with a wealth of different information about the protoplanetary disks. So we can get chemical spectra like shown over here where you can identify um, emission lines from different species by comparing with laboratory data and uh, determine the chemical composition of this disk gas. At the same time with things like the ALMA array, uh, you can actually create spatial maps. So each of these is for one protoplanetary disk, a different chemical species, and you can see how that gas is distributed and emitting. And again, like the image I showed earlier, you can see a variety of different structures with different rings and emission on different scales. And that just shows you the chemical complexity that is occurring within a single object. And now the really cool, but also really complicated part about studying protoplanetary disks is that you can't probe the entire structure with any one observatory. So you have to do multi-wavelength astronomy where you're combining observations that you get in the infrared, which probe the warmer inner disk gas, but is not sensitive to the outer disk. You have to combine that with uh, millimeter observations that are sensitive to the cooler outer disk. And then even with all of this together, there's still regions in the midplane where there's just too much material for any photons to escape. And so you can't really probe those observationally at all. And so the information that we can get about there really comes from the composition of planets and planetary bodies in our solar system, including studying meteorites and meteorite compositions so that we can get some idea of what the chemical composition of this hidden material in the inner disk is. And we have to put all of this together to synthesize one big picture of what we think the chemical composition um, throughout the disk is and what we think the planet forming compositions are going to be with distance from the central star. And so now I'm going to go through a few examples um, from my own work of how we can measure these different quantities of mass composition and lifetime for protoplanetary disks. So starting with mass, now you would think 
that the mass of protoplanetary disks, just knowing how much total material is there is such a fundamental thing that it would be fairly straightforward to do. But it's actually a bit complicated. And I'm gonna use this uh, analogy to explain why. So measuring the mass of gas in protoplanetary disks is sort of like if I asked you to count the number of people in a room and you're like, okay, that seems pretty straightforward. I'll just start counting. But then I turned off the lights and you're like, wait, how, how am I supposed to do this now? But then as you peer into the darkness for a few minutes, you notice that there's a few people in the room that are wearing glow in the dark clothing. And so you're like, I can count those few people. But now the trick is I need to determine the ratio of the number of people wearing glow in the dark clothing to the total number of people in the room. And this is what our problem is in measuring protoplanetary disk gas masses, because the vast majority of the mass uh, the gas mass is in molecular hydrogen, but molecular hydrogen is not emissive um, under these cold temperatures in protoplanetary disks, so we can't see it. So instead, we have to look at other molecular species that are much uh, brighter emitters and then really understand the ratio between those rare species that emit brightly and the total amount of gas present. So that's what uh, my work is focusing on, is estimating this ratio. So in particular, the rare but bright species that we're able to observe is carbon monoxide. And we really want to get at the total mass, which is almost entirely molecular hydrogen. And so we have to estimate very carefully this ratio of carbon monoxide to molecular hydrogen. And that's something that I have been working on by observing different molecular tracers, including the nitrogen species and 2H+. And so um, in this plot here, we're showing how the ratio of the N2H plus to CO um, emission in the disk is very sensitive to this ratio of CO relative to H that we need to estimate the total disk gas mass. And so um, my work has been uh, looking uh, at a variety of different protoplanetary disks and measuring this N2H plus relative to, to CO ratio in order to um, convert between the CO emission that we can observe to a total disk gas mass. And so here's a plot from a recently accepted paper of mine showing uh, in different colors disks that are different ages from different star forming regions and um, their estimated masses uh, when we use this correct conversion ratio. And you can see um, why we're interested in doing this is we wanna understand um, how much material in these disks and how much uh, of that could contribute to forming planets in them. So I've shown here on this gray line, the amount of material that is in uh, Jupiter in our solar system. And so you can see that anything that falls below the line actually doesn't have enough material in the entire disk to form one Jupiter-sized planet. And so then it becomes a question of, does that mean that it's rare to have um, planetary systems like our solar system where you have multiple gas giants? Or does it mean that this planet formation has to occur even earlier prior to the protoplanetary disk stage when there was potentially more material around? So it can be very informative to understand um, disk gas masses across populations like this and get a better understanding of how it could contribute um, to forming different types of planets. And in um, that vein, I'm currently working on a um, large survey with the ALMA array that's going to look at 80 different protoplanetary disks. So this plot here is only showing um, 20. It's going to be much larger and a uniform array, um, sorry, a uniform survey that will um, do this type of analysis uh, for the largest set of protoplanetary disks that we have looked at in this way to date. Uh, so on to the second point, uh, what we can learn about the composition of protoplanetary disks. Uh, in my work, I'm particularly interested in uh, how carbon is distributed throughout the disk, mainly because carbon is a very important element for life here on Earth. And it's interesting chemically because it can exist in a variety of different chemical forms that can be in either the solid or the gas phase, um, depending on where it is located throughout the disk. And so here um, I'm going to demonstrate uh, the, what we expect that the distribution of carbon would be throughout the disk, just based on what we know from where carbon is present in the interstellar medium. So this is the earlier stage where we're inheriting carbon from 
about half of that carbon is expected to be in some refractory form. So that means it's going to be solid up to very high temperatures. Here we consider high about 500 Kelvin. But in terms of uh, this picture, you can see that uh, it would be solid all the way up to very close to the star. So within the distance of the Earth from our own sun, when we would expect there to be carbon-rich solids throughout the rest of the disk. Meanwhile, the rest of the carbon is in volatile form, um, mainly carbon monoxide because it's a very stable, simple molecule. And uh, we would expect that to freeze out as ice further out in the disk at somewhere tens of AU, but be in the gas phase everywhere else. But that's our expectation. But when we compare it to uh, actual uh, knowledge of the chemical compositions of bodies in our solar system, we have a problem because we know that rocky bodies in the inner solar system, particularly our Earth, are carbon poor. So people have made estimates of the total amount of carbon in the Earth, and it's shown that the carbon to silicon ratio of the Earth is significantly less than what we would have expected it to be based on the interstellar dust grains that we think the Earth formed from. And so it's uh, not possible for us to have carbon-rich solids all the way into the inner disk as we would have expected. Uh, and so it's not clear uh, where the carbon-rich solids are present throughout the disk. In addition, uh, for the volatile carbon, we would expect there to be carbon-rich gas everywhere interior to this uh, freeze-out line where um, it's too cold and it freezes out into ice. But we have a variety of different observations of protoplanetary disks with the um, ALMA array that suggest that we don't know uh, where the carbon is going because we don't see as much carbon monoxide gas in these disks as we would have expected. And so that leaves a lot of questions about um, how carbon is distributed throughout the disk because it's really not matching our expectations. And in particular, we're really interested in where the carbon is in the inner regions uh, right around where the Earth formed and where we would expect Earth-like planets to form around other stars. And given that uh, it's unclear what's happening in these outer regions of the disk, we're not sure if we expect to have carbon mostly in the gas, meaning that it wouldn't be incorporated into a solid rocky planet like the Earth, or if we would expect to have um, much more carbon present in other uh, systems around different stars, unlike what we see uh, for the Earth in our solar system. And so the way that we can address this particular question is largely through using observations with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so this is a um, uh, mission that uh, has been really active, launched in the past few years, and we're really excited in the protoplanetary disk community because we're expecting to see a mission from a large number of uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen bearing molecules as shown here. So here's a plot um, from my own chemical modeling where um, this is showing an expected spectrum from the uh, mid-infrared instrument of the of JWST the James Webb Space Telescope. And so it's showing the variety of different molecular species that we expect to be sensitive to. And indeed, uh, recent observations have been able to observe not only this, but even more, including larger um, hydrocarbon species, um, in addition to um, isotopologues. So we have uh, expected to see uh, CO2, but they actually see the 13 CO2. So we are really sensitive to even more than we had imagined um, with these new observations. And that's going to tell us a lot about the chemical composition of the inner regions of protoplanetary disks and help us solve um, this mystery of where the carbon is, whether it's largely in the gas or in the solids and what that means for farming Earth-like planets around other stars. And uh, finally, uh, thinking about the lifetime of protoplanetary disks, uh, the main method for uh, investigating the lifetime of protoplanetary disks is basically to go to different star forming regions. So each of these um, points on this plot here it represents a different star forming region and measure the disk fraction, meaning whether 
out of all the stars in that region, how many of them have um, their disks. And so you can see for star forming regions of different ages, the amount that have disks uh, drop off over time. And this largely uh, around uh, this region, by 10 million years, you expect uh, very few of these stars to still have disks. And so then any uh, formation of gas giant planets would have to happen in these uh, earlier ages when there's still gas present. But the problem is that uh, plots like this one shown here are made based on observations from the near infrared, which is largely sensitive to small dust grains close to the central star. So this isn't actually telling you about the gas, and in particular, the gas that is further away um, from the star, which might persist longer if you have the disk clearing from the inside outward over time. And so what we wanna do is be able to make this type of plot, but for uh, measurements of the gas masses and how much material is present, um, for disks in star forming regions of different ages over time. And uh, one of the things that's really interesting about this is that when you look at the gas in these systems, there's actually a few that are in this age range of around uh, 10 to 15 million years where you would expect the disks to all be gone and the gas to all be gone, but ALMA is sensitive enough to detect very weak emission from uh, CO gas left remaining in these systems. So it's uh, when we're thinking about what is the tail end of the lifetime of protoplanetary disks, it's important that we understand whether this mysterious gas is actually protoplanetary disk gas, or if that gas is all gone and now this is being released in later stages by things like collisions of comets or breakdown of comets. And so it's um, no longer gas that came from the protoplanetary disk. And so that's something that we can investigate from chemistry. And so this is a project that I'm working on that I've cutely named the ghost versus zombie project because we're trying to separate these two different scenarios by looking at these very old disks around 10 to 15 million years old. And we wanna understand if this mysterious carbon monoxide gas is either the lingering protoplanetary disk gas, the ghost scenario, or that it's regenerated from collisions of comets, the zombie scenario. So you have this gas that's coming back um, after the protoplanetary disk is gone. And so uh, thinking about this from a chemical perspective, we expect that the chemical composition of the ghost um, protoplanetary disk gas is going to be very different from the zombie gas that comes from comets. So we expect in the first scenario to have a gas composition that's similar to the mature protoplanetary disk um, with a lot of gas. So those are going to be almost all uh, molecular hydrogen with relatively small amounts of carbon monoxide and water. Meanwhile, you would expect this uh, second scenario to result in gas that has very little molecular hydrogen, but instead it's very CO and water rich, similar to the composition of comets in our own solar system. And so uh, we devised a chemical test where if we observe this uh, nitrogen species N2H+, we expect this to be present in the H2 rich gas because um, hydrogen is important for the formation of this molecule. Um, but in the second scenario, we do not expect to see N2H+, because um, in the water rich scenario, this actually uh, will disfavor the formation of N2H+. And so by looking for N2H+, we should be able to distinguish between these two different scenarios. And so that's what we did with the recent program that I had with ALMA. So we selected here these two targets shown in red, and the plot is showing that these two targets have uh, similar amounts of CO emission to these uh, somewhat younger protoplanetary disk composition, but along the x-axis, they have um, much lower millimeter flux, meaning that the solid material um, has evolved away from the protoplanetary disk phase. But we expect, uh, but we see here that the carbon monoxide, there's similar levels of CO as the protoplanetary disks have. And so we looked for N2H plus in those two systems and did not detect it in either. So since N2H plus is not present, we expect that there is not a large amount of molecular hydrogen gas there. And instead, um, this is favors the zombie gas scenario where the CO that's present is coming from 
comet-like bodies that are either colliding or photo evaporating or somehow releasing their gas in a um, sort of secondary process way. Uh, so uh, this is the summary of my talk. I have uh, stepped through how we've been measuring mass composition and lifetime of protoplanetary disks in an effort to understand how we can connect our understanding of protoplanetary disks to the different um, planetary outcomes that could come from this process under different conditions around different stars. And uh, in summary, uh, probing the basic characteristics of protoplanetary disks can tell us about the physical and chemical environments within them. Um, and really to do this, we need a combination of the chemical modeling along with observations from different observatories and combining with both the planetary science community to understand our own solar system with astronomy to explore elsewhere. Um, so it's a very interdisciplinary um, problems that we're trying to solve here. And uh, we can really investigate how we go from uh, protoplanetary materials to the planets themselves by tracking the chemical elements throughout this process. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for listening. Uh, I think you said that um, our own solar system showed less CO than you were expecting. Do you have any hints as to why that might be? Uh, so are you talking about carbon in the earth being less than we expected or uh, in, in, in our, you know, in our disk, such as it is, which is mostly planets now? Yeah, so we don't know exactly for the, our solar system specifically, but when we look at systems that are around um, what we thought, what we think our young sun would have been like, we do see that um, the CO is missing. And it's kind of a mystery right now as to whether uh, there's sort of two scenarios that could be locked into bodies that are forming. So you have, you know, the solid comet-like bodies that are forming and you have the CO freezing out into the solids and just getting locked there, never um, being re-released into the gas. Or you could have it be converted into another chemical species. So the CO could be going to CO2 or even some of the larger hydrocarbons. So then, um, that would be altering the chemical composition of the gas and it wouldn't, CO wouldn't be the main carbon carrier anymore. So those are the scenarios that we're trying to piece out with further um, chemical observations and paired with the modeling. Yeah. So, yeah, really interesting. Really interesting. Um, I'm, I, I didn't understand Quite as much as I had hoped I would, you know, <laughs> it says more about me than you, obviously, but, um, you know, one of the other people we had speak recently um, was talking about the potential for, or the uh, potential for the abundance of life forming elements, similar mm -hmm. to you, but, but uh, outside of the 1AU-ish habitable zone that we Think about so in, in particular some of the moons and the ice giant the ice moons mm -hmm. and the, the gas giants. Um, how does your understanding and your your very in depth understanding of the structure and the formation of planetary disks suggest that there may or may not be the necessary elemental um, building blocks present? in those outer outer regions i mean is it supportive is it you know does it contraindicate or is are we talking apples and oranges and they have nothing to do with each other so one of the things i'll say that's really complicated with comparing with bodies in our outer solar system like moons and even like kuiper belt ob objects around pluto and whatnot is that the observations we have there are a, a thin layer of their surface and so then trying to understand what that means for the bulk amount of elemental material, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, that we need to compare to here is kind of an extrapolation, the step of we got to assume that the bulk is representative of the interior, or we have to have some model to say how the bulk is going to relate to the interior. So that's where it makes it a little apples and oranges to try to compare. Um, but at the same time, I think, uh, we can say, for example, when, when I was showing this plot about the carbon, um, oh, where's, 
let's see, when we have sort of this picture of where we think the carbon is present, we know um, from comets, we have a pretty good idea that there's a lot of solid carbon in their interior. And so that is consistent with the idea that you have these carbon rich solids in the outer disk. Now, if we could have those kind of measurements that went sort of all the way in, uh, because right now we have sort of the earth and we have comets, we have a little bit from meteorites, um, but we still have some holes in between. And it's also kind of a mystery of does it drop off or sort of, um, I should say, does the, the carbon in solids increase over time or is there some sort of, or I don't mean time, uh, with distance, I mean um, from the sun or is there a sharp cutoff? So that's something that we really have to piece together with little bits of knowledge from everything. So we're trying to connect those two together. And the outer um, disk is much more consistent than what we have for the inner disk at, at present. I have a question from the internet audience. Uh, Dan Ward's asking which emerging technology tools will have the uh, best impact on your observations? Yeah, so I think right now JWST is making the biggest splash and we still have a lot to learn from there. There's a lot of the protoplanetary disk science is still in the stages of being processed and hasn't been published yet. So I think uh, even thinking for the future, we still have a while of um, understanding what we have to work with right now from JWST, but certainly um, there's plans for a future mission that would be a far infrared space telescope, something similar to the Herschel Space Observatory um, that we had in the past. And that's something that we don't have any facilities currently that can observe in the far infrared. And that would be another game changer for understanding protoplanetary disk chemistry. Thanks. Could you make uh, observing requests of JWST? Uh, I've tried a couple of myself. I'm part of teams. It's very competitive. They're in this uh, last cycle. They're, I can't even remember now, but it's, it's like orders of magnitude more hours that people ask for than um, actually uh, uh, get awarded. And so um, I've been part of two large teams that I've actually gotten JWC time that um, is being taken uh, in the next few months. And so uh, we're all very excited about that. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. Uh, one, I, I think I, I hope I understood this correctly. Do, did you say that the in, in our own solar system, the gas giants formed before the inner rocky planet? That's what's thought. Yes. And if that's a, if that's the case. How would how would we explain a an exoplanet, say a high speed of it? Yeah. That, that's a really interesting question, and that's a, a mystery that people are trying to solve. Um, is, one thought is that they formed uh, in a similar location to where we have the gas giants in our solar system, and then they migrated inwards. And there's a couple different processes that that could happen through, either through interacting with the disk gas causing that migration or interacting with other stars nearby, having gravitational effects that help pull that planet in. Um, there also are people who think that maybe it does just form uh, in close to the star, and it's kind of a mystery why that happens in some cases and not others. Um, but yeah, that, and that's something that else that we can investigate through chemistry, because if we understand what we expect the chemical composition to be at all these different locations, then we can measure the chemical composition of those inner gas giant planets around other stars and compare them to where um, we expect the the that chemistry to exist within the disk. And so that, that's active research going on right now to understand that. Okay, I'm glad I'm, I'm just not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what did I thought one more? Well, was there one more already? Yeah, sure. For in, your, uh, in your zombie, yes. Um, this is making more sense as I'm rolling the question over, but um, is the implication of that there's just in, in the earlier uh, uh, post disk, but pre everything's all in order uh, situation, that there's just an enormous number of these gaseous comets uh, flying around and eventually disintegrating, running into things. Yeah. Okay. Certainly, we doesn't feel like we have a huge, I mean, a huge amount of power, but not like, not like that. Not enough to produce the same amount of gas. These are flying things for that. 
So this is true that, um, so we, we do expect there to be sort of a dynamically unstable period in between the everything in order and the protoplanetary disk. But um, we also do have to reconcile with how do we end up with as much gas as we're observing here? And is it even possible to have that many small bodies? And it's not clear in all of the systems. There are some systems that have a ton of gas that just can't feasibly be explained by comets, which we, that's not the two systems I showed there. So maybe there's, you know, a variety of different things going on in, in these different systems. But yeah, that's definitely a problem is do we have the, the material there? Mm -hmm. When you're detecting the molecular lines and the spectrum, like in the web, um, you have to rate the intensity of those lines to the amount of material or the density of the temperature. That is also an important like a uh, uh, collaboration between uh, us and and the uh, the physical chemist and atomic uh, chemist to understand. So for some of the more simple molecules, we understand it a lot better. Um, and it's definitely important because there are some regions where, um, depending on what you assume, you can get very, very different answers. And so there are some cases where they take into account elect uh, collisions with electrons or collisions with H2 together, but you do have to model all of those separately. And you do sometimes get different results if you don't take into account some of these important effects. Mm -hmm. Did you have one more question? Yeah, I do have one more. And it just, um, you know, how, you're, you're dealing with measurements here that are, again, on a cosmic scale, are pretty small. That, that one AU is not much when you're talking some of the you're, you're using. How accurate are your, how accurate is your ability to measure those distances of you know the one AU? I mean, I, I know you had like a logarithmic scale almost going under one ten or so on. I mean, how, uh, what, what's your error bar on the distances? So we can't actually, spatially resolve the 1AU close to the disk. So I, I pulled up this image because here we're more on a scale of five to 10 AU is roughly what's, um, or I, I should even show the, the best that we have uh, for protoplanetary disk is in the dust with Alma, where here it's about like a five AU. I think that's what this bar is here, um, is what we can get down to. And so we can do that pretty well for the outer disk, so this could go somewhere 100 to 400 AU uh, between the different disks. And so there we can get precision, but when we get close to the star, it's much, much more difficult and we don't have any programs that have really done that yet. And JWST won't have the, the spatial resolution like this. So some of the transitions you're looking at that occur within that 5 AU space, you're, you're you're making strong educated guesses based on that because you cannot resolve the measure that. Exactly. You're you're getting one measurement for a whole region of maybe 10 AU interior to the star. And that's where the models have to come in and say, you know, what what do we expect all the finer scale things to be based on our model that matches this bulk uh, measurement that we get. And how do you validate the model if you can take measurements? You measure as many molecules as you possibly can and try to fit them all with the model. Or you have other measurements you, you take into account as much of um, understanding the star really well, understanding the dust, the outer disk, the inner disk. You really just try to collect everything you possibly can from the observations and use those to constrain the model. But but there's still a lot of unknowns and a lot of question marks. So, yeah. Well, I've got a question. Can I ask you one question also? Which, we have people online also questions. Uh, we're watching here. Not okay, right, more yet. Right. So I've got two kind of unrelated questions. Um, one, uh, have there been any advances in ERI or uh, interferometry? Because I 
when I was uh, in this, I was dabbling with looking at YSOs with, uh, or, or here I are, Jay, okay? I didn't get much. Uh, I was using the char array. I didn't know whether or not that had, this was years ago, so I didn't know if it's, as it, it has grown in any way, people from one of I remember hearing someone talk about near IR interferometry. Um, and I remember, yeah, it, it has not, I, I would say it not, has not grown to the, the level of scale um, that other things are, but I know that it, it's come up and it, it could potentially be useful. I've, I've got mm -hmm. some images of, of some YSOs that are, you know, one AU, two AU, they're very, very boring. Uh, so I didn't know if it got any better. <laughs> Uh, the second one was, um, I think you may have implied this, but do we have, given your modeling, do we have any indication as to when planetary formation actually begins? Does it begin in the type 2 YSO phase or can it begin in the type 1 phase? So that is a really hot topic because of these images here, because you have all these gaps. So this is, this is the class 2 protoplanetary disk stage. Um, and... Uh, one of the theories for why these gaps exist is because you have a gas giant planet, something like a Saturn or Jupiter, that is collecting the gas from this region and creating these clearings. Um, so the idea is if we already have um, gas giants at this stage, they must have formed earlier. And then all of the um, problem I talked about before where we don't see enough mass in the class two stage suggests, well, maybe then they had to form in class one. Um, but that's something people have gone and looked at class one objects to see if there's these kind of structures and they largely don't see them. Um, so it, uh, it, it is kind of a, a question now of like how early do we have to push planet formation and can we reconcile that also with planet formation theory at the same time? So, yeah. yeah. Related, um, do we, do we ever have any hope of maybe Directly sounds wrong, but directly observing those protoplanets that may be forming in those planets. They have with Alma in a few very, um, very few example cases where they can directly see a protoplanet that's kind of in like one of these rings as it's forming. So that's something where people are really pushing the limits of the telescope in order to be able to observe that and even better try to get like chemical compositions or temperatures or more information out of probing that directly. So that that is a hot new area right now. Mm -hmm. uh, back to the 1AU business, um, is that strictly considered the distance? Are you correcting for the mass of the central star and its effect on temperature and pressure? So here, uh, 1AU, I'm thinking of strictly as the distance, but if we're talking about the habitable zone, then you definitely have to think about the conditions around the central star. So when you're thinking about uh, disks around stars at different sizes, you want to kind of scale up what you think, and even when we think about chemistry in the disk, that's also going to kind of scale with the the temperature that's coming from the the central star. So yeah, we have to uh, account for all of that, and that's one of the reasons to take into account the models because then you can think about you know the properties of the central star and how you think temperature is going to change with with distance. Mm -hmm. Are the central stars a, spe a specific classification, or do they vary a lot? Uh, so the ones we're mostly interested in here are ones that we think are applicable to our young sun, so sort of K and M stars. Um, but uh, definitely people look um, across the range of stellar masses. But as you get to the larger ones, because they have such shorter lifetimes, you can't really catch the protoplanetary disk phase. Mm -hmm. uh, question in the back. Um, how rare is it to go up? Like a protoplanetary So it depends on what wavelengths you're trying to go for. Um, there are disks. Uh, so if you're looking at sort of scattered light wavelengths, so um, infrared, near infrared dust, then they do do coronography where you block out the star so that you can be able to see the disk. Um, and they do that a lot when they're trying to look for planets in the disks too. Um, but uh, in cases uh, like I'm interested in with Alma, the light from the central star isn't um, 
there isn't very much light coming at these long wavelengths. And so it's not actually a problem and the disc really does stand out. Mm -hmm. uh, like how many Uh, so it's in the hundreds in terms of, especially the ones that have been looked at with Alma. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's quite a variety that we can see. And that's largely sort of a distance bubble around us before it becomes too faint for us to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, about how big is that bubble? Are we talking just our, you know, our subsection of the Orion spiral arm or pushing up beyond? So people have been talking about pushing further, but um, so so right now, uh, everything that, that I've shown in these pictures are about 150 parsecs from us, so not even as far as Orion. Um, but uh, people have been thinking about looking at other parts of the galaxy, but then we run into the problem that you mentioned earlier, you're getting kind of one blob for the whole disk and maybe even stuff around the disk. And so it's hard to do uh, this type of, you know, precise understanding the the chemistry throughout it. <laughs> In, it, when you take the cross product of your work and then modeling of uh, the galactic structure, is there any reason to suggest that it, that this isn't a homogenous thing that would be seen? I mean, obviously, the you know, in the core, all bets are off. But as you get out in our band going around the galaxy, any reason to believe that this is not homogenous? So they do see, I think it's from looking at like stellar compositions that the elemental composition changes throughout the galaxy. I know that they do expect there to be um, different, uh, so lower amounts of. Um, like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen relative to iron. So that what they usually refer to as metallicity that varies um, throughout the galaxy. It's not something that I've explored too much in my own work, but I do know that that's um, something that could potentially be a factor when we're thinking about things further away from our neighborhood. Well, this has been very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, something, a little something for you. I mean, oh, thank you. A few you. other things, but. <laughs> put that on you got plenty of those yeah i got and uh but thank you very much for, for thank I hope you. you since you're saying the area you're going to join us you can join know <laughs> that if you like because we have members but that's someone else we have members all over the united states and some overseas as well so annapolis is only across the river yeah. you know so so we let we let them in too all right well thank you all very much um we're right on time tonight and um, look forward to seeing you out there observing. And we also...